So how to write a great technical resume for uh, New York City Python meet, Meetup here in December uh, 2020. Um, so who are we? We're Elite Resumes. We write experienced engineers resumes for free. It's anybody with two plus years uh, experience. So I'm going to be talking about uh, engineer resumes, technical resumes for anybody really in technology, two plus years uh, of experience. Uh, my background, I write the largest career advice newsletter in the United States, goes out to an audience of 9 million every Monday morning. Um, I've written Amazon number one bestsellers on resumes and uh, interviews, uh, published uh, eight years ago now, the famous, if you ever heard that soundbite about recruiters only spend six seconds on their first scan of your resume, that was a um, study we published in uh, uh, 2012 um, using eye tra hooking up recruiters to eye tracking studies and uh, all that. And it's true, they really, the, the first scan is six seconds. Um, in addition to attending Python Meetup, I'm the founder of IO Soho, New York's largest uh, iOS uh, meetup. And in the past few years, I've focused uh, a lot more on tech resumes uh, rather than just resumes uh, generally and uh, have started Elite Resumes, where we do free resume talks, free resume rewrites for experienced engineers at EliteResumes.com. So talking about great technical resume for 2021, I'll, I'll talk for about 20 minutes and then take your uh, Q&A. Um, I just love resume, to I love careers topics, love resume topic, uh, so excited to uh, do this tonight. We're gonna review Google's top search result uh, and talk about what's right and what's wrong there. Um, I'm going to show you an example of what a great technical resume looks like. We're going to go through in detail as to why, step by step, um, and then uh, we'll take your uh, Q&A. So software engineer resume template. Uh, this is what you get. Uh, top result on Google is uh, from zeddy.com, and this result is very, very wrong. Um, it is, uh, it's a common kind of look for uh, 2020. A lot of uh, projects, you know, or new products that are launched on Product Hunt will produce a resume that looks something uh, something like this. A lot of fads and, you know, um, uh, maybe perhaps wishful thinking going into uh, creating resumes like this, but that can really hurt you when it comes to actually applying, actually going through interviews, actually getting your resume into companies. Let's go through in detail. So first off, uh, it's a three column format that breaks every resume parser uh, used in the world. It doesn't seem like it's something obvious that ought to break a resume uh, parser. Or, but what happens is um, when these are created with uh, tables and cells, you'll see that all the years are in one particular row that, ends, that usually ends up meaning that they're in a set of cells. Uh, the world's resume parsers that companies using their HR systems and applicant tracking systems, uh, turn your resume first into a plain text file. It's the first thing they do. They get rid of all the formatting, everything, they turn it into a plain text file, and then they try to build it back up. And that's because there are so many different uh, varieties of what people do on resumes. The first thing that the parsers need to do is break it down to plain text. When they break a resume like this down to plain text, that means that uh, what the uh, company's gonna see is uh, Tabitha's name and uh, a little bit of her background, and then this whole string of years, and then software engineer and all the uh, companies, and won't know which years go with which uh, which companies. Uh, email is unclickable because they've chosen this resume designers chosen to use blue. Uh, they're unable to uh, hyperlink the uh, uh, email easily or, or readily, and so have kept it plain. And so it's not it's now it's not clickable. Um, which if you want to be contacted with your resume, that's the whole reason you're putting it out there. You prefer to have your resume uh, clickable. Uh, shows LinkedIn instead of uh, GitHub. Uh, LinkedIn is a subset of your uh, professional information. Uh, your resume ought to be a superset of your professional information and achievements. There's really no reason to have your LinkedIn on an engineer's resume. Um, uh, but you ought to have GitHub, particularly if you have an a active or interesting uh, GitHub. Uh, only mentions five technologies for someone with four years of experience. Typically, what we'll see is uh, two plus years experience. You ought to have 10 technologies that you're proficient with. Um, and, you know, this includes things like CSS, HTML, 
uh, whatever databases that you're most familiar with. So we'll see 10 uh, technology for somebody with two plus years experience uh, up to 25 if you're 10 plus years uh, experience. Here, this uh, tab has got a you know, four year resume with only five, technolo with only five technologies mentioned on it. Uh, the skills data is represented visually. That's an error. The world's resume parsers cannot read visual representations. Um, has no idea that those bars are anything, you know, thinks those bars are useless formatting and deletes them. So uh, the uh, adaptability, agile processes, all these like these, these bars don't mean anything and they end up taking up space that could have been better used for a more productive purpose. The solid block paragraph text at the top, nobody reads solid block, nobody reads on the internet, first of all, but uh, nobody reads solid block uh, paragraphs, particularly uh, recruiters uh, don't read it. So you're wasting valuable space for something that people aren't gonna read. Uh, professional headlines uh, de-emphasized, going back to that six second scanning study, uh, the you really need to have a bold professional headline that lets people know hey what should i hire this person for uh the resume lacks numbers uh, locations for the companies are missing uh all in all the achievements tabitha's actual achievements professionally as a software engineer take up less than 25 percent of the space which is horrible it's like it's a disaster um you know, we want the substance to be more than the packaging. And that's not the case here. Uh, certifications, interests, foreign languages. Um, you know, it's five lines, ends up taking up about 15% of the uh, resume. It's too much space. They don't need to have their own separate sections. And then really one of the worst things is these uh, resumes tend to encourage uh, people to put bullet points down like built modern applications, develop services, consult with PM. Uh, these are job description. Uh, bullet points rather than, um, sorry, uh, these are job description bullet points rather than uh, uh, achievements. And it's really super important that um, instead of just listing what your duties were as an engineer, you're talking about what achievements you had and what you accomplished as an engineer, which is ultimately why somebody's going to hire you. So that's why the top search result in Google is uh, a horror show. So before we go into what a great technical resume ought to look like, let's talk about what a resume is. A resume is an advertisement. That's all it is, it's an ad. To your future boss, to get you an interview for a job that you can succeed in. And that's it. We tend to come up with a lot of different things that a resume could be. It's none of those. It's an ad to your future boss to get you an interview. Uh, your resume's goal is to get you interviews. It's not, you're not going to get hired based on somebody seeing your resume. They're not going to call you up and send you an offer letter. Uh, uh, your resume's goal is to get you interviews. And then uh, in another meetup, we can talk about what to do in interviews. But your resume's sole goal is the more interview requests it generates for you, the more successful that resume is. If you want to talk about, um, uh, you know, what's our OKR for our resume? That's what our OKR is. Generate interview requests for me. So what's an effective resume? Uh, ultimately, your resume is not about you. It's about your abilities and what you can deliver to a company. The mistake we often make in writing a resume is that we want to write, look, it's our resume. It's about our career. It's about what we spend half our time doing. We want to write our resume to say what it felt like to be me at these companies and what my career has felt like so far. But that's not what a resume is for. A resume is to tell your future boss what it felt like to be your boss. And that's a pretty big difference between what it felt like to be me and what it felt like to be my boss. Um, so uh, your resume is not your bio. This is not your chance at a uh, biography. Oftentimes because people, uh, look, this is the only document written document that most people have about them. Um, and so we start to put uh, things and beliefs onto our resume that really don't belong there. It's not your bio. It's not your academic CV. Academic CVs tend to be five to nine pages with all of your publications and uh, the conferences and the talks that you've done. That's fine for academia. For for-profit uh, enterprises, 
where you're applying with a resume, this is not your academic CV. It is not an exhaustive category or a catalog or inventory of everything you've ever done. By the time you've gotten 10 years out, uh, complete years early in your career will be a single line of text on your uh, bullet. And some very, very important projects and some big things that happen in your life are no longer gonna be on your resume because they're not relevant to getting you an interview today for the job you're looking for today. Uh, resumes should not have unique designs. It's not time for you to show off your design skills, uh, your good taste in picking out clever designs, um, your, your excellent uh, command of the standard Google font uh, types and your ability to use multiples of them. It, this is not the time. It's not a narrative. It's not really telling a story about you um, other than what you can do for a company. And it's not a mirror. Uh, this is not, your resume is not the version of yourself that you like to think about most. As a human being, you've got family, friends, uh, beliefs, uh, uh, hobbies, interests, religion, um, you know, all sorts of this complex web of who you are as a person. The resume's job is not to be a mirror for that. Uh, so you really need to kind of drive that thinking out. It's a lot of it is uh, subconscious thinking that ha people have or uh, misunderstandings. Your resume's job is solely to get you interview requests uh, for a job that you can succeed in. So what is an effective resume? This is what an effective uh, technical resume uh, looks like. This is one of the few times in marketing and advertising that as engineers, our preference for the simple, non-fluffy, non-fancy design is actually the superior answer. And uh, look, we've done a lot of uh, uh, eye tracking studies and studies with recruiters over the years um, at Ladders. And it turns out that simple resumes are easier to read. It's, it's uh, uh, re recruiters get better information off of them. They prefer them and they're more effective. Um, so this is what a great technical resume looks like. And we're gonna go through uh, section, uh, section by section. So coming back to uh, resumes job is to get you interview, re interview requests. So what is your future boss looking for? When she's looking through a pile of resumes, trying to figure out out of these 100 resumes that I got, what, who am I going to interview? What are the six to 10 I'm going to set aside to interview? What is she looking for? So she's look, we're going to talk about some pretty obvious things. She's looking for someone who's looking for a job with a similar title to the job that she's trying to fill. She's looking for, for somebody who wants to fill the job that she has open. She's looking for someone who's achieved results uh, that she needs from her team. She's looking for somebody who can communicate about those achievements in a way that's uh, level appropriate um, in technology. Uh, technology is a very collaborative uh, field. Being able to communicate effectively within, it's not about being a fancy uh, speaker or being able to do TikTok, but being able to communicate effectively within the technical context is important. And she's looking for somebody who's a little bit better than everybody else in the pile. So let's go through this uh, step by step. So looking for a job with this title. You, look, you might have applied for the job. You might have had your friend refer you for uh, the job. Uh, to you, it might be super obvious that, yeah, I'm definitely going to be interested in a job like that. It, I can tell you, it is not obvious to anybody else on the planet. Somebody with a resume just like yours yesterday told that hiring manager or told that recruiter that they totally weren't interested in a job uh, like that at all. So it's not, it might be obvious to you. It's not obvious to anybody else. Uh, let's take a page from coding. Declare it explicitly. Declare the jobs that your uh, job titles that you're interested in. So in your professional headline, you summarize yourself accomplished. In this case, Stephanie has said accomplished lead engineer. Um, and then you list four job titles that you'd accept. In Stephanie's case, uh, senior site reliability engineer, lead DevOps engineer, senior DevOps, head of DevOps, uh, somebody earlier in their career might say front-end developer, uh, software engineer, uh, software programmer is still a term used in some uh, areas. Uh, but you list job titles that you'd actually accept. Uh, when recruiters are going through and doing that six-second scan, it's super helpful for them, uh, particularly if they're not uh, technically adept and they're just doing the uh, screening for a hiring manager. 
It's super helpful for them, for them, for you to list, here are the type of jobs I'm good for. Um, so up here, you wanna be a little bit uh, aspirational and show jobs that are at the high part of your current level or maybe into the next level. Uh, it is important though, and I'll make a note, your past titles, the titles that you've actually had. And one of the things that we've discovered at Leet is that um, sometimes people feel that they can be a little bit uh, uh, a little bit aspirational with past titles. You absolutely cannot. The job title that you got the offer letter for, the job title that you got when you were promoted that is on some official company document is the precise title you need to use on your resume. There, there's, very, there's very little about a uh, resume, which is an advertising and a marketing document. There's very little that you're really gonna get hammered for if you're off by a little bit or you're approximating, except for the precise title that you had and the precise degree that you either earned or didn't. Those are the parts of the resume that have to be absolutely uh, uh, correct. So, you know, if Stephanie was a DevOps engineer at Twitter, that's great. Um, but if she was, you know, if she was actually, her title was actually DevOps engineer, but uh, she was the only person in uh, New York working on uh, DevOps and she put head of DevOps uh, for Twitter New York uh, and that's not her title, that's a bad thing to do. So, Going back to our hiring manager. So uh, she's looking for somebody who achieved results. Uh, do not copy and paste your job description on a uh, resume. If you work with elite resumes, we'll uh, come back to you on this uh, over and over again. Uh, your job description, which is honestly what most people do, isn't what you're gonna get hired for. The, 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 the description of the job that you're currently doing is not why somebody's gonna hire you for, your future, for a future job. They're going to hire you for the value that you demonstrated at that job. So what does that mean? Uh, so you list your top achievements up here in the professional summary. Um, in this case, uh, Stephanie says exceeded goals, drove performance gain, reduced downtime, del delivered cost savings. That's level appropriate for somebody nine years into their technology career. Each bullet point should be uh, an achievement, not a duty. Because you were there at that company, what changed, what got better, that's what you want to uh, share. Achievements should have comprised about 50% of the resume. You're going to get hired based on what you achieved and what you can achieve in the future. You ought to use most of the resume to talk about your achievements. Uh, technologies are not enough. A lot of times engineers will say, well, look, here are the 17 technologies I know. Why isn't that good enough? Because I can tell you the hiring manager going through the stack of 100 resumes Everybody else has got 17 technologies too. It's not the technologies that you know that will get you hired, it's what you did with them. Um, so talking about communicating achievements, it's important that you communicate with data. Now look, uh, again, for a marketing exercise, an advertising exercise, this is like the most engineer friendly marketing exercise in the history of the world because you ought to communicate with data. And you ought to communicate with numbers. You're an engineer. You're a scientific, rational, systems-focused human being. Please, 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 please use numbers to describe the work that you've done. Don't say, I worked on site load time. It's just not as effective as decreased load time from 700 milliseconds to uh, 322 milliseconds. Quantifying it makes it um, a much more effective communication of what you've done. Um, and it's what we do in our day-to-day -day jobs uh, anyway. So let's dig into Stephanie's um, uh, resume. Achievements are all denominated numbers. You know, another way that you can think about them is uh, what's your high score? Uh, you like getting, uh, you like trying to uh, you break your high score on uh, uh, games that you play. Think about what your high score was at, at work. The numbers that show what you achieve for your team and your company. Uh, if you're two years into your career, you're going to have, you're going to stretch and you're going to try to get 10 bullets together about what you've achieved over the last uh, two years. At 10 plus years in your career, over a two page resume, you'll have about 25 uh, bullets. Net, net, we're asking for two to four bullets a year. Two to three to four things that you did in a company in the space of 365 days that justified them paying you uh, the amount of money that, that, you, got, uh, that you got paid. Um, if 
you're working someplace and you can't think of two things that you did this year or last year that were worth them paying what you paid, um, that you increased the numbers, you have to kind of think through like, you know, uh, you have to think through your career uh, objectives at this point. Are you at a place that is helping you achieve your best work? Because if you can't think of two things that you improved over the course of the year, something's a little bit wrong in terms of your alignment with management about how you're improving the company and how they're improving your own career. Uh, another thing is that numbers give a sense of scale. It's a pretty big difference when you say, um, you know, saved a hundred grand versus saved 10 million on uh, expenses or uh, built an app that had tens of thousands of concurrent users versus built an app that had 10, tens of millions of uh, concurrent users. Um, and each bullet ought to be about an achievement not was responsible for, not was on a team, not managed, but delivered, secured, achieved, reduced, decreased, improved. And noticing the clock here, I'll pick up the pace a little bit. And then uh, she's looking for somebody who's a little bit better than everybody else in the pile. So uh, look, as engineers, you're, you're not typically the uh, folks that toot your, uh, toot your horn. So just a few things to do here. One is be explicit about promotions. Uh, a lot of times at Elite Resumes, we see somebody with an eight-year career and now says senior software engineer. Um, and we'll ask, well, look, I mean, were you always senior software engineer there? Well, no, no, I started as a junior engineer and I worked my way up. Be explicit about that. That's super, uh, super important, uh, super helpful. Um, because then you can say promoted five times, uh, which is a source of external validation. Somebody outside of you said that you did a good job. That's really helpful and really important. So on your resume, you're going to uh, share four capabilities that qualify you for the jobs that you say that you're um, uh, qualified for. Be explicit about those uh, promotions, uh, both up at the top and in the body of your uh, resume, and include any awards, honors, or any other external validation that show somebody besides you and your parents think that you're awesome. So uh, review. Here's Google's top search result versus what a actual great technical resume that's more effective uh, looks like. Comparing them, the great resume is simpler. It scans better. It's, easy, uh, it's easier to read for the hiring manager and the recruiter. Uh, it's data-driven. By sharing numbers, it shows what that engineer has been able to use technology to achieve. It's focused on achievements and not on a, a distracting format. Um, and it's numbers heavy. Numbers are just much, much more effective language on, uh, on resumes. And look, the criticisms of a more effective resume are, hey, it's boring, it's monochrome, it's predictable. Uh, when, it, when you're thinking about that experience of the hiring manager going through the stack of 100 resumes or the recruiter, think about your experience looking through apartment listings or Airbnb listings or uh, grocery store listings, you're not looking for each listing to have its own unique format and layout. You want all those things to kind of have the information in the same place. You want that format to be boring so that then you can actually see what the apartment or the item uh, is all about. And you can look through the pictures and the pictures can be interesting and the content can be, can be interesting and the price can be interesting, but the format, you kind of want the format to always be the same. So uh, if the criticisms are, hey, it's boring, monochrome, and predictable, that's exactly the purposes for um, uh, the great technical resume. So in summary, and then I'd love to take your questions, great technical resume for 2021, focus on achievements, not job descriptions, numbers, please, please be uh, uh, numerical, uh, use dollars, use percentages, use units, use units of time to explain and confirm and demonstrate the changes that you were helpful in creating at your uh, prior employers. Boring format, compelling content is really the best uh, combination. Uh, or also you can always have Leet Resumes do this for you for free. We do free resume talks and free resume rewrites for experienced engineers at Leet Resumes. So uh, thanks very much. Happy to take any and all of your questions. And you can always uh, find me on Twitter at uh, Senadella. Thank you very much. 
great. Thanks so much, Mark. And we really appreciate you sharing your expertise on this. Uh, I actually uh, am encouraged to uh, perhaps go back and reformat my resume at this point. <laughs> great. So let me, um, so let's see, can we get a copy of the slides? Yes. Uh, how can you get accurate percentage numbers to put on your resume? Um, well, look, look uh, how are you confirming with your boss and your team today that you're doing the right stuff? In your sprints, in your work, how do you know you're working on the right stuff? Um, is first off where we got to start. A lot of times we think about one-on-ones or meetings with the boss as something that the company wants to do. Uh, I've been writing a career advice newsletter for 17 years and more today, more than ever, you taking control of that one-on-one -on -one and those conversations are important for your career. Uh, somebody in 2020 is going to have far more jobs than somebody in 1980 ever thought they were going to have in their uh, career. It's important for you to be able to, to communicate the achievements that you had. So looking at, Hey, well, uh, the sprint and what my team says that we're working on is trying to get more engagement for the users or trying to drop, uh, uh load time or trying to improve the latency on, you know, a higher number of concurrent users. Um, any of, uh, any of these things that you're trying to improve when you do it, when you build it, you got to follow up and say, well, hey, that thing that we built, was it worth it? Are you guys using my time correctly as an engineer? And is the work that I'm doing uh, productive? Uh, you don't need precise um, you know, percentages. If the true percentage was 37.2% and you say grew at 40% or grew at 35%, that's fine. Um, the problem is if you say, hey, grew at 40% and then like, it, in fact, it only really grew 3%, you got to be approximately right. Uh, Nobody's going to hold you accountable for like the decimal points after you know, the, the values after the decimal point. Um, but you got to be approximately right. Hope that uh, answers your question. And lots of questions coming in here. I'm going to keep reading. Uh, awesome. For less experienced engineers, one year, what can be carried over from your uh, example? So uh, look, the reason that we don't do under uh, two years is two years, you know, in the first two years out of uh, educational institution, including uh, boot camps, it's a different resume. Your um, education tends to go up at the top. Uh, projects, which are not actually, um, uh, you know, they're not effectively in production at a for-profit uh, company. Uh, so it's more difficult for hiring managers to kind of assess the, uh, what you deliver. It just ends up being a different resume than what we have uh, the experience in. I think what you can carry over is what you really ought to be focusing on as you build your career is you are responsible for your career. Um, we never really had lifetime employment in the United States of America. It was, uh, you know, it was kind of a myth. Maybe some of the very, very tippity top people did, but we really didn't have lifetime employment in America, but there was a little bit of a myth that we did. Uh, but IBM certainly had like a lifetime employment plan. P&G, Procter & Gamble, had a lifetime employment plan that went away in the 90s. Before then, companies took the responsibility for moving you around to different jobs and, and giving you a fully developed career. For a lot of reasons, almost all of them I think are good, we decided that didn't make a lot of sense and that people ought to control their own careers and move from company to company as they go through their uh, careers. That's awesome. But, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. You have the power to choose your own career. With that comes responsibility that you have to understand, how am I marketing my career? How am I talking about my career? Uh, how am I taking accountability for the success of my career? And really at, at the core of it is being able to talk about what you did last year, the year before, the year before, and what you delivered for your employer in exchange for cash and free food and uh Metro card. Uh, you have to take responsibility for I'm able to I'm able to communicate not in fancy marketing language doesn't have to be uh, an award winning uh, TV commercial, but able to communicate in a, in a level appropriate way. Here is what I was able to do in my uh, in the past year, uh, I was assigned to deliver a lot of web features. Uh, overall, we delivered 37 web features. 
that ended up uh, our engagement rate went from uh, 12% to 25% on uh, our daily active users. Whatever it is that you you did, talk about, you know, at the core of it, you at least got to be talking about the technical, even better if you can talk about the business impact of it. Hope that, hope that makes sense. Um, I think you can see that I love talking about this. So getting me to shut up will be difficult. Please cut me off anytime. Uh, as someone that's transitioning into data science, uh, what should I put at the top of my resume for accomplished? My background is in engineering, energy uh, engineering and business development. Um, look, well, you're not, you're not quite a, that the adjective that you put up there um, uh, changes based on where you are. If you're a uh, new entrant uh, data scientist, it's um, you're probably going uh, more with uh, hope rather than proven. So you're going with uh, uh, focused, dedicated, um, enthusiastic. You know, you got to sell what you're what you're bringing to the table. If you don't have ten years in data science, but you're bringing a lot of enthusiasm and hey, I'm new, I want to learn. Use adjectives more along uh, along that line. Uh, as a self-taught engineer, should I put my EDB courses under uh, education? Uh, so the real question is how, you know, so how does this help you get uh, an interview? If you've got, um, look, if you got 17 of them, it's too much. If you got like three or five, uh, I, I, typically what we do is we put a space under the technologies and list them as briefly as possible. It's good because it shows that you have a, uh, you know, a goal to doing, um, you know, some type of, you know, further, uh, further uh, education, they should not be in the education section proper, uh, at least as of yet, they just don't have that same uh, weight. So I put them technologies, then space, then, uh, then a couple more. Uh, and I don't want to eat up too much of your time. I, I will answer questions. You will never get me to stop taking Q&A, but uh, I want to be respectful to the meetups time. I, I think it's totally fine, Ridwin, as long as, um, you know, it's okay with you. Yeah. yeah, I'm good with it. Please, I mean, yeah, this is people have all questions. Works. Now's your yeah, time to get them answered. Um, Tom, I'm not quite sure what your question is. If you want to, I'm curious about this too. I, I need a little bit more to do something there. You started a job as a web developer for Army government as a contractor, and been four months with no task. Wait, you're getting paid because you're getting paid and not doing anything for the army. The, doesn't the government really need people to be doing work right now? Uh, okay, but let's say you overall, let's say you, uh, you've ended up in some strange position and you're not really uh, doing anything. Um, uh, use the time to bone up on uh, learning a new language to learn new framework uh, or whatnot. Uh, at some point, getting paid for, uh, let's call it a year of doing nothing, uh, does hurt you. A little bit, right? But it does hurt you because the somebody says, "Hey, well, what you do in 2020? Nothing, you know, cash paychecks. Woohoo! It's not what a future employer wants to hear. It's not what your future boss wants to hear. Um, uh, but if you can, uh, there's, you know, and again, with army, go army government is a special case. In a for-profit company, you can find something to fix. I guarantee you, there's some bugs that you can just go fix. Uh, I don't know about army contractor if it's kind of not allowed to do it quite that uh, quite that way. Um, how does elite resumes make money providing free resumes? You know, one rule we had at IO Soho is that when people came up with like new projects or uh, open source things, the one question you're never allowed to ask is how are you going to make money off of it? But honestly, we don't know. Like, uh, I'm just, I'm fascinated with resumes. Um, maybe uh, if we get really good at this and, you know, we're, we're scaling up to do thousands a month. Uh, you know, the plan is, hey, can we get employers to sponsor your resumes? Or can we uh, sell salary negotiation services? Something of that nature. So uh, we don't know yet. Um, any tips for those trying to change fields? Uh, change into technology is a tough one. You're really, I mean, effectively going back to being a new grad. Uh, you know, changing from front end development to, uh, to data science or something like that. It's always easier to do that inside of a company rather than try to go from employer A as a front end developer and employer B, I'm trying to get a data science job. Just they won't hire you for that because they've got data scientists that they can uh, uh, they can hire. Uh, anytime you're trying to change a field, it's always better to do it within a company. Um, you don't have any technologies mentioned in achievements. 
Uh, no, no technologies mentioned achievements. Only at the uh, only at the bottom. There's uh, look. There's a valid. Uh, there are two valid schools of thought here. We put technologies uh, all together at the bottom, uh, all in one space. Others put them above education, and a rarer group put them even above uh, work experience. Um, there's no. Uh, no, none of those three versions is right. Uh, the reason that we've chosen to put it all the way at the bottom is that every other resume in uh, professional life just goes from professional summary to work to education. So recruiters who are hiring people who are not, you know, besides outside of technology, which happens a lot, particularly in startups, are used to this format. And then they can look at the technologies at the bottom and the resume parsers honestly don't care. Um, so that's why we chose what we did. Uh, it is not wrong though to have the technology section above uh, above education. Uh, how can I as a trans person communicate uh, achievements published under my old name without wasting too much space on it? Uh, you know, publications really, so you shouldn't have publications generally on your uh, uh, on your resume, uh, on your for on a for-profit resume. Academic CV is a completely different thing. Uh, I can't weigh in on that. Um, Perhaps using, you know, if your first initial is the same, uh, uh, that'd be helpful or uh, just citing last name. Um, but that's a little bit outside of my uh, wheelhouse. But in for-profit, um, first off, by and large, nobody cares about publications. Uh, is, pro is probably the best news in terms of getting around that particular conundrum. Do you have any suggestions for places to get better examples for less experienced people, uh, lead junior resumes? Look, if you're coming out of uh, one of the code schools or your university, they're the best places to go, uh, honestly. Um, along with a link to my GitHub, should I put my portfolio website up here? Great question. So uh, a lot of folks start a portfolio uh, website or some website that they hope to keep up. Uh, I would say 80% of the time at Elite Resumes, when we click on that link, there has not been an update since 2017. You know, uh, if you're going to have a website to show off what a clever, clever engineer you are, you must keep it up to date. If it's not up to date, it looks awful. Same thing with your GitHub. A GitHub link looks terrific. If you haven't updated anything in the last 24 months, uh, uh, you're doing yourself more harm than good by, inclu uh, by uh, including it. Uh, what about not-for-profits uh, or let's call it NGO uh, resumes? Uh, look, they they are numbers driven to a certain extent. They've got to raise money or, or get grants. Um, it is far, far less uh, numerically driven. They tend to be more uh, uh, mission driven. Um, the best ones do, you know, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, they do use OKRs. They do use uh, numbers. Um, uh, so you won't be harmed by using numbers, uh, but it is a little bit less important in that world. And uh, okay, I think we're getting to the to the end of uh, our our questions here, and I'll turn it back over to Lauren. Uh, and there's some conversation going on. Attach a link to my blog posts, such as Medium. Look, if they are phenomenal technical blog posts that you know people have responded to you and said that is awesome, it's great stuff. Even if it's like super super obscure and boring to the general population, but very interesting to somebody in your field, then yes, it, it has to be professionally excellent at the level that you're looking for. If you're a two year, you know, front end developer, and you've written a little bit about learning, you know, different frameworks and things of that nature, and done a good job at it, that's fine. That's enough. But that same content for somebody who's 10 years into their career, isn't going to uh, put your best foot forward. All right, well, that's great. I will share the uh, uh, the links, please. Uh, I like to say that we at Leet Resumes, we have a, uh, not an NDA, but an MDA, mandatory disclosure agreement. I would like to ask all of you, I'm not gonna say raise your right hand, but please promise mandatorily disclosure agreement. Tell everybody you know. Uh, we write uh, experienced engineers resumes for free at Leet Resumes. Thanks so much for, uh, for having me. It's been great Q and A. Really appreciate it. And back over to our unflappable host. Thanks so much, Mark. It's really wonderful. Um, 
and we'll make sure that everyone gets this uh, recording afterwards and uh, that we can provide you. Can we provide like a little like media kit of like uh, an example tweet or something like this? I could put something on NYC Python. We've got a Twitter now, so I could put it on twitter.com slash NYC Python and get right. everyone to retweet it. So uh, let me know what kind, of, what kind of promo you want. We'll make sure right. it happens. Awesome. Thanks so much. Amazing. Thanks so much again for coming. So red one, I'm going to go ahead and spotlight you now, moving okay. forward. All right, great. Um, yeah, thanks again, Mark. That is a wonderful presentation. You have made me question everything about my resume now, so I'll be working on that, um, but extremely resourceful. So appreciate that. So let me jump over. And just to check, Ridwan, I'm still recording. That's okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay. Can you guys see that presentation? Yes. Perfect. All right. Before I jump into it, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. So I am a current Metis Data Science Bootcamp student. Um, last year, I actually jumped into software engineering, just teaching myself for about a year. I didn't really know where I kind of wanted to end up as far as what I enjoyed. I mean, I enjoyed a lot of the nuances of it and whatnot. Um, it's just, I felt like something was missing and I had always worked with data as far as work goes. And then I took these entrance exams and then got into Metis and I've really been enjoying a lot of the work that I've been doing. Um, and yeah, so this is actually my last project and I just kind of want to share this with you guys. And please let me know if you guys have any questions at the very end. Anyways, so go ahead and jump into this. So my last project was about autonomous driving object detection. So now they say a picture is a thousand words. Well, in my opinion, in this case, I feel like a picture is a thousand directions. And let me show you why exactly. So here we have a video of a Tesla and it starts up here. And so as you can see, the Tesla is an autopilot and it's detecting objects via its cameras right now. So it's showing the three cameras and it's picking up the cars, uh, the people, uh, the dogs, et cetera. So this basically feeds back into the autopilot system and tells it, all right, take a left turn, take a right turn, et cetera. So this is only one element of the Tesla autopilot, but this is what we wanted to focus on. And I wanted to build a model out um, just looking at objects essentially. So as far as my object detector goes, so what did I want to recognize? I wanted to just recognize signs, traffic signs, lights, and other vehicles on the road, essentially. Um, as far as going about this, well, I had to kind of figure out what am I looking at exactly? How do I want to approach this? So I was actually referred to an open source notebook by a couple of classmates. So I utilized that as kind of like my backbone for everything. And so that, there my workflow was utilizing darknet and yolo so darknet is the neural net that i would be utilizing to help build out my yolo real-time object detector model so as far as object detector goes and then traditionally how it would work so as you can see there's a sliding window and an image so basically it's going over going over the image going over the image going over the image until it spots okay there's the car so this is extremely computer intensive extremely inefficient. And the thing is, if you want this to happen in real time, you don't want to drive down and then all of a sudden your autopilot say, oh yeah, by the way, that's a stop sign 15 seconds ago. It needs to be instantaneous. So introduce YOLO, you only look once. So this was created by Joseph Redmond back in 2015. So here we're going to take an example of a dog, a bike and the truck here. And what it does is initially it segments off the picture into a grid. And then it's going to define the classes. So define the objects within the picture. So here we have dog, bike, and truck. Perfect. But it needs to locate them with the boundary boxes. And we call this image localization. So essentially with this, um, it will locate the dog, the bike, and the truck. And then you have these other boundary boxes, which will essentially be empty. But then you put all this together and then bam. There you go. Now we have located your three different objects here or your three different classes in this case. So in this case, it's nice because you only literally have to look once instead of if you remember the previous uh, example, it was a sliding window going over and over and over again. This is better for real time. So before we actually build the model with Darknet and YOLO, 
what we need is we need to collect images because with a model, you need to feed it. You need to help it understand. You need to get it to understand what it's looking for exactly. So I ended up using Google Open Images. And so I collected images of traffic signs, traffic lights, cars, and then stop signs. Why stop signs? Because a stop sign is essentially a traffic sign. However, with YOLO v4, uh, YOLO version four, it does have pre-trained weights on many different classes. So in this case, it was uh, it, it was the pre-trained weights off of the uh, Microsoft Coco data set with 80 classes. And three of those classes were stop signs, cars, and traffic lights. So this is perfect. And the reason we want to use the pre-trained weights is because we want to increase the precision, which I'll get into later. So basically, I have my images. I know I'll be utilizing Darknet, and then that will help me build out the YOLO model. And so I'm predicting that my traffic sign precision will be lower, which is okay because it's not pre-trained, um, but we can iterate on that. So once I had my results, this is what I got. And this is my actual video. All right, so we recognize traffic lights, cars, bam, perfect. And then traffic signs, excellent. And that's what we were really going for as far as this goes, because the other two, we knew it should recognize it because they're pre-trained, but could recognize the traffic signs and it does. So as far as quantifying goes, so this is a mean average precision and I'll break it down for you after I go over these numbers here. So as far as the mean average precision goes, it's the model is looking at the object and it's basically saying, all right, this is a car, I'm 80% sure it's a car. All right, not bad. Uh, stop signs, 98%, traffic lights, 75%. Traffic signs, it's basically every one out of two times. So this could definitely use a lot of work um, overall. Uh, the mean accurate, uh, average precision was around, I think, 77% when I averaged it all together. Um, so this is fine for now. As far as how I calculate the mean average precision, well, actually, YOLO does it for, for you on every thousand iterations of training the model. It was done with intersection over union. So let's all look at this nice kitty over here. So the ground truth box, which is the red box, so that is actually drawn out before you submit it to the model. So you're essentially labeling that and you can use another uh, software program and you uh, draw out this box on the kitten and you show, okay, this is where the kitten is. And the predicted box, boundary box, that's basically saying the model, okay, this is where I think the kitten is. And so you're really just looking at the intersection as it's named intersection of reunion. And so that's how you compute your intersection of union area of overlap. So imagine a Venn diagram, you're looking at the middle section. What is the area of overlap over area over union? Both the circles in the Venn diagram are in the union over here. So then the higher the number, the more accurate your precision is essentially. So that basically is done for every single object. So your average precision for every object and then the, or sorry, average precision and then the mean average precision for all of them all together. So that's how that's calculated. Um, so that's basically it for as far as a model goes, just jumping in a couple other things here. What I wanna do for the future is just build out a dash cam. And this is actually already built out on that open source notebook on the Android uh, folder. And I just deployed it using Android Studio. Um, I use the pre-trained weights because I haven't loaded my own model onto here right now. But as far as future work, just showing you, so it picks up the car, picks up the trucks. Uh, it's gonna pick up the traffic light here in one second. And it's, it's a little delayed, so maybe it's not perfect. It can be worked on, but that's what I like to do. And then this kind of just opens up doors as far as, oh, okay, this is kind of like the stepping stone to object detection. And I just found it super fascinating and uh, felt like it was worth sharing. All right, so in conclusion, uh, key takeaways with object detection, you're really able to track everything, anything and anything you want as long as you continue to feed the model information. With mine, I want to feed it more pictures of traffic sense because the mean average precision is not good. Um, and the future work building the mobile app. So before I leave, uh, I just want to show this video. So this is actual drone footage that I took. As you can see, it is picking up all the cars, which is amazing. This is pretty cool because, well, yeah, it, it, it's just cool to see, just look at, at this. It's not picking up all the uh, stationary cars in the far corner over here. So um, you obviously have a lot of, uh, yeah. So, and then here I'm gonna show you, this is gonna be a false positive. That's, that's not a car, it's, that is a boat, um, but that'll be worked on as well. So as far as that goes, it was really cool to see that. However, one thing that really kind of creeped me out 
Oh, sorry, I exited out of it. Was essentially, uh, Joseph Redmond said when he was actually approached by military personnel, when they talked about object detection and YOLO, they said, oh yeah, we like use this to track cars and people. And obviously that can lead to drone strikes. So when he heard that he was horrified and he said at the beginning of 2020, hey, I'm not gonna work on any more computer vision work. Um, so that includes object detection. So that really got me thinking like we as data scientists have the responsibility to be ethical, work for the sake of society. And obviously I'm beginning out my journey to this and I'm just like starting out these small projects, but there's just something that I wanna hold on to. And this is like for any line of work really, right? You should be ethical in the work that you do. Um, and the point of this was I was able to build this using tutorials uh, in the past two weeks. And then even I have a drone and my drone footage was recognized via the object detector. So imagine where bigger powers are doing and whatnot. Uh, so that's kind of what I end this with, more of an ethical topic, but I hope you enjoyed my presentation. If you have questions, um, I will gladly take them. Please visit my website, ridwanolive.com. If you have any other questions, ridwan102 at gmail.com. Um, yeah, I'm obviously looking to get hired as my data science uh, bootcamp is ending, or just please reach out to me as well. I just love talking about this sort of stuff, technology in general, it all fascinates me. So whatever questions you might have right now, I will take, but uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Great, thanks so much, Ridwan. Mm -hmm. Looks like you have some questions in the chat. Sorry, I'm gonna exit out of this. Uh, in the first video, what do you showed your model? Did you record that while driving or what drone do you have? Um, so yes, I recorded that while I was, well, not, I wasn't driving and recording. My mother was driving and then I was recording. So don't try to get me in trouble here. Um, so I recorded that video and then I ran it through my model and then it probably took about five to 10 seconds for it to compute. And then it spat out my output there. Um, and then the second video that was done real time. Uh, and as far as drone goes, I have a DJI Phantom, uh, was it standard three, which I tried to turn on today and now it's not working. So uh, if you have suggestions for me, I'd love that. This one is ultimate goal, this project. Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. This is more of a research project, I would say, and kind of jumping into object detection. Um, the biggest thing was, I just wanted to see if it would be able to pick up traffic signs because YOLO v4 wasn't pre-trained on traffic signs. So I really wanted to see, okay, can it be trained on traffic signs? And so we can kind of round out the object detection to be kind of like a part of an autopilot. So it's really just jumping into it. Um, yeah, it's more of an intro, I guess you could say. That's the biggest thing for it. Uh, that, I do not, oh, so how relevant is a computer vision machine learning project to day-to-day -day work in a data science role? I would ask all the other data scientists if anybody wants to chime in. I guess that would depend on if you are doing computer vision or uh, computer vision work because that's, that can be a completely different field from what I understand. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure. It just depends on your role. Uh, you making change to the video before putting in the model and downscaling? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. So basically my model is built uh, via darknet and then it's a YOLO v4 model. So I actually had to convert it to TensorFlow Lite so then it would be adaptable for mobile applications. And then uh, you can actually use it on Raspberry Pi as well. I'm having a lot of trouble with that right now. Uh, the app pulls up when I have my model on there and then I try to use the camera and it just crashes. So if anyone has any experience with that, please reach out. Oh man. Uh, regarding the ethical repercussions, how do you propose limiting bad uses of this technology? Uh, Pandora's box is a real thing, yikes. Oh, all right, so. Uh, Again, just being new to the field and being more introduced to this stuff more so recently, uh, as far as Joseph Redmond goes, you can see it two ways, right? So you could see it as, all right, he's stopped. He's going to stop doing work with computer vision. Okay, because he feels like this is what I'm hypothesizing based on his TED talk, um, because he feels like he's contributing to something bad now. Um, 
okay, so that's fair. You don't want to contribute to that, but to play devil's advocate on that. And well, the thing is you created this and this is wonderful, yet it's a monster at the same time. And things, if you walk away from it, then you're almost kind of doing disservice to everyone else because you are the creator. So you know this best. And it's almost at that point, I mean, you could almost go into like, I guess, policy in a sense. Um, just because, I mean, then you kind of have to question, it's like, all right, well, do we regulate certain things or do we not? So that's, that, that, that's a great question. I don't know. I got to think about that one. Um, but yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, but search for all. How big was your data set? Um, I so I. How big was your data set? Have you tried a Raspberry Pi for uh, eight gigabytes? So I did not work on this with Raspberry Pi at all. That wasn't really my intention at this point. How big was my data set? I had around, it wasn't as big from what I understand as far as object detection goes for pictures or images. Mine was around 6,000 images, I would say. Um, and then a lot of others can be much more than that. All right. Any other questions? How expensive? Um, how expensive is the real time detection? Um, sorry, when you say expensive, what do you mean exactly? We're talking. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not really sure. I would have to really look into that. Uh, I, the biggest thing with that was I kind of got it deployed, I was like, all right, this works fine as far as the statistics behind it goes. I'm, I'm not really sure about that. Um, so what did you use for training infrastructure, AWS or local with add GPU uh, memory? I did not, definitely did not run it. I have a 2011 MacBook Pro with a solid state hard drive and no GPU. No, this thing, no, that's bad news. So I actually just ended up using Google Colab. Um, that was just the simplest for me at the time. I hadn't worked with AWS too much, but Google Colab was pretty simple because you could pay uh, just 10 bucks a month and they would give you 32 gigabytes of GPU. And that worked out quite well because I would only have to wait several hours for my model to train. Anything else? I think that's it. Looks like you answered all the questions. Okay, sweet. Yeah, thank you uh, so much for having me. This is cool. I actually, my first project I presented on where I did a full stack app was actually one year ago exactly. So this was cool. Amazing. Yeah.